Hello and welcome. I'm Larry Janke, fruit winemaker and a friend of Northern Brewer and Midwest Supplies. They've asked me back to help with a video on how to make wine from fruit. Today we're going to be introducing the Master Vintner Fresh Harvest Fruit Winemaking Kit. Just as an overview, we're going to go through everything that is included in the kit, everything that you need to make a one gallon batch from fruit, either fresh fruit concentrate or from fresh fruit from your yard. And it's important that you know how these wines taste. So at the end of the video, we'll crack into a bottle of a raspberry and a very special elderberry I have. So we can show you the differences and also how easy it is to make wine from different types of fruits. Before we dig in, we're gonna take a quick look at what's included in the kit. First off, when you first unpack the box, you'll find a two gallon fermenter. This is where the, all the action and the fermentation happens. It's a very nice bucket and it also has graduations on the back so you know exactly where you're at. It comes with a nice seal to keep it airtight and an airlock to keep any contaminants out. It also includes a one gallon carboy with a cap and another airlock which is what you'll use to transfer your must into the carboy when you are working on clearing the wine. Also included in the kit is everything you need for the ingredients. There's Camden tablets to keep it sanitized. There's acid blend to add a little bit of a snap to your wine. There's potassium sorbate that you'll be using at the tail end in case you're sweetening it back. Do not put this in at the beginning of your winemaking process. There's yeast nutrient that keeps the yeast happy while it's fermenting. There's a no rinse cleaner. One of the most important things in winemaking is make sure everything is sanitary. If you're cooking around the kitchen, you're not gonna use a dirty pot. So you wanna keep everything nice and clean. Also included is wine tannin. You won't be using this on all different types of fruit wines, but you will be using this to give a little bit of a dryness to your fruit, add a little bit more taste. Also included is pectic enzyme. This is very important for the people out there making jelly. You know that all you have to do is just heat up your, your fruit and it's instantly gonna solidify into jelly. The pectic enzyme will help clear it and it'll keep it from gelling. Also included in the kit is yeast. This is the most important part of the process is in order to get it to ferment. The yeast eats the sugar and creates the alcohol for your wine. To get started, we're using the Premier Cote de Blanc, which is kind of an overall yeast. Later on, once you are a little bit more in tune with your winemaking, you can use different types of yeast. But to get you started, we want to make sure that you're successful. Also included is a hydrometer. A hydrometer is what measures the sugar content of your wine. That's also gonna give you a great idea of what your alcohol content will be at the tail end. It's very important that you get it right at the outset. We'll show you how to use that a little bit later. It also is included is a racking cane tubing, and that's how you get your wine must from the bucket into the carboy. That way you keep the oxygen off of it so that you don't turn your wine brown and oxidize it. Otherwise you'll have a really nice port. <laughs> also included is a uh, bottle filler this will, be, this will be showing you how to use this at the tail end, and that's in order to get your cleared wine, once it's finished, from the carboy into your bottles. You can make, as mentioned before, you can make fruit wine from fresh fruit, from frozen fruit, or from fruit puree. Um, what we're gonna be doing today is we're gonna start with the fruit puree, and we'll show you how to make that a little bit later in the fresh fruits and the uh, frozen fruits. The nice thing about the purees, is that those are available all year long. This is the raspberry that we're gonna be using today. Northern has a variety of these available. There's like a dozen different types of fruit that you can get in puree form. The other thing that you're gonna need is your sugar. You can use various types of recipes. I'm gonna be going through a recipe that I've used for many years. There's a recipe book that's included in the kit. They're also available online. They'll give you a basic understanding of how much sugar, how much acid blend, how much tannin that you'll need to make a successful batch of fruit wine, uh, depending on what type of fruit that you're using. And the sugar, I use cane sugar, and like I said, the jury's still out on which one's the best. I avoid brown sugar because it's got molasses in it, just anything that'll make the yeast happy. So what I've done ahead of time is I've got everything pre-measured. I've got my water, my sugar, the fruit, and my fermentation bucket. Along with the kit, you'll find a bag. It's a fruit straining bag. And you notice it's a little bit damp. Everything's been sanitized and ready to go. 
um, any kind of bacteria that you'd have in your ferment or any utensils that you use, not going to be your friend. So you want to make sure that that's nice and sanitary. So we're going to set this aside just for a moment and show you how to do this. The other thing that you'll need is a good spoon. We also have stainless steel spoons. That's been sanitized as well. And that's nice for stirring in, especially when you're stirring in your sugar. So let's dig in. First thing you want to do, open the can of puree. <laughs> Don't forget that part. So you just take this and simply pour it into this bag. And probably do a better job than I just did. What you're doing is you're trying to catch as much pulp that might be in the puree as possible and get as much juice into the fermentation bucket as possible. I know a lot of people will, will use the can for measuring their water as well, which is a pretty good idea because even when you're making soup, you want to clean out the inside of the can. So now that you've got the fruit in here, you'll notice that it's kind of like a tea bag. So all of your juices are running down to the bottom. And like I mentioned before, the bucket actually is graduated, so you've got the half gallon, the one gallon, and the one gallon and a half measurements right on it. So at this point, what you want to do is you want to add water to it up to the one gallon mark. And even though it's pure water, I even sanitize the gallon jug to make sure that there isn't any contaminants going into my, into my ferment. So at this point, you just simply pour the water in to the one gallon mark. And as I mentioned before, a lot of times I'll even rinse out the can. You know the inside of the can is sanitary as well. This way you get all of the, all the fruit pulp possible to give your wine a full flavor. And then you fill it up to the one gallon mark. Stir it in and then we'll be adding our, our sugar and our other ingredients to it as well. And now you've got a really, really nice batch. And like I said, it's like a tea bag. All of your fruit flavors are coming now through the straining bag. So at this point, I'm just going to add the granulated sugar and stir it in. And after this is fully dissolved, what we're going to do is we're actually going to test the sugar content. Most recipes are very, very close. You want to get to 1.095, which is a specific gravity, and I'll show you where that is on the hydrometer scale as well. If you're using fresh fruit, this is going to take a little bit longer because you're going to want to, um, you're going to, want to strain out as much of the fruit as possible. The ferment bag is actually going to be in the fermentation for the first week anyway, so you don't have to get all of it out, but you want to extract as much of the color and the juices as you can. And then we'll add the other ingredients. Once the sugar is completely dissolved into your must, you want to take a hydrometer reading to find out if the sugar content is where you want it. As I mentioned, the hydrometer is a very good tool for that. Having a test jar is even easier because in this situation, the hydrometer won't go down into the must far enough in order to measure your specific gravity. So this is very, very handy. So how do you get it from there to here? <laughs> the easiest way is to use a wine thief. We also have a three-piece wine thief available. It's very, very easy, easy to keep sanitized. Comes in three pieces. The way this works, you put it together. There's a hole in the top of the thief. So all you have to do is just dip it down into your must, put your thumb over the top of it, and you'll be able to draw out some of the must. You put that into the test jar until the hydrometer starts to float, and then you can take a reading. The best way to take a reading with this is at eye level. So you want to find where the specific gravity is. The easiest way to know is that's the gauge that's got the one on it. So you're looking for a one point something. As you can see, the hydrometer reading is about 1.092. We want it to be somewhere between 1.085 and 1.095. We're right in between there. So we've got that handled at this point. Now we can add the rest of our ingredients into the must. So the additives that we're going to be using today for our red raspberry wine, we're going to be using yeast nutrient to keep the yeast energized. We're going to be using acid blend to just kind of snap it up a little bit. And then we're going to be using pectic enzyme. The pectic enzyme will break up the pectin, give you a nice clear wine at the tail end. 
The recipe that I'm following calls for just these three ingredients. I know that some will actually have you add wine tannin to the raspberries. I will typically do that at the final step to see if it needs it or not. Depends on how much of the tannin is drawn from the seed when you put the fermentation bag into the wine. Depends on how much of that is extracted. You can taste test that at the tail end when you're finishing off the raspberry wine. So on the pectic enzyme, it calls for a half a teaspoon, so it's two of these. Make sure that this is nice and sterilized, nice and, nice and clean. Just sprinkle it in on the top. Sometimes I feel like the French chef where it's some of this, some of that. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So as far as the acid blend goes, the acid blend calls for three quarters of a teaspoon. So that would be three of these. One, two, three. And the yeast nutrient calls for one full teaspoon. So that would be four of these. One, two, three, four. They dissolve very, very quickly in the wine. And like I said, that keeps the yeast nice and happy. You stir this in. You've already taken your specific gravity, so you know that that's correct. This is all stirred in. You notice the fruit is in a fruit bag off to the side. It's a lot easier to stir the ingredients in with the fruit bag out of there. So now it's time to pitch the yeast. The yeast that's included with your kit is the Premier Cote de Blanc yeast, which is very, very good for fruit wines. And at this point, just open up the package and you just simply dump it in. The yeast knows what to do. You don't even have to stir it. Then all you have to do is add the fruit bag to it. That'll help to stir up the yeast as well and get everything started. Put a nice knot in your fruit bag to make sure that all the pulp doesn't disappear and then you're actually including the fruit bag right into your fermentation bucket. This will extract all nice colors and the sugars that are left in the pulp. When you've got a final wine, you want to make sure that it's nice, bright, and red, and it looks like the fruit you made it from. So strawberries are going to be kind of a reddish orange. Peach should be light and almost clear. Pears, almost clear. Choke cherry, black. <laughs> Depends on what fruit that, that you have. So at the tail end, you want your wine to smell and look like the fruit that it came from. And then you pop the lid back on, make sure it's nice and airtight, and then attach your airlock. Now for the airlock, what you want to do is you want to make sure that it has water, sanitation solution, or some people even use vodka. <laughs> what you want to make sure is, is that this airlock won't dry out, and you also want to make sure that if you have a reverse barometric pressure, that it doesn't suck something back into your wine. So you want to make sure that that is nice and sanitary as well. As the yeast consumes the sugar, it releases carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide will not only help to protect the wine from oxidation, but the airlock will allow that CO2 to come out of the fermentation bucket so that it doesn't wind up bloating or blowing up on you. You want to keep this in a 65 to 70 degree area for the first week for a good fermentation process. If you're doing a dark red fruit, you might want to do it a little bit warmer, 72 to 74. But Typically in a basement or a basement bathroom, if you've got one, typically it's dark and it's nice and cool. The reason you want to slow down the fermentation process is because the fermentation process goes way fast, then you're actually stressing out your yeast and you'll get some off flavors. And you don't want those either. You want a pure raspberry, in this case, a pure raspberry flavor at the tail end of it. You don't want it tasting yeasty. So you want to keep the yeast nice and happy, nice and cool, nice and dark. So now that we've shown you how to make fruit wine, from a can, from a puree, from all sorts of different flavors. A lot of you are probably wondering, well, what happens if I grow my own fruit? Well, there's a couple of different ways that you can still find fruit. You can get it in the store, and you can get it in the frozen food section, or from fresh. Basically the same, same process. Put it into the freezer, and then when it thaws out, it's gonna look like this. This is more of this is raspberries that I had in my backyard, and same thing. I pick them every day, 
put them into a Ziploc bag to keep the oxygen off of them, put them in the freezer. When I've collected three or four pounds worth of raspberries, then I can thaw them out and make my wine. The other thing nice about that is that they'll keep fresh in the freezer for a few months. So if you're not ready to make the wine right away, they'll still be available to you. So if you're picking raspberries or black raspberries or your fruits in, uh, like strawberries in June and July, you can put them in the freezer and then you can have them available to make your wine during the fall. If you're working with apples, uh, that sort of thing is going to come in later on in the fall. Same type of thing. So you freeze those and a lot of people ask too, that's a good question, is that why can't I just take them and put them into a blender and blend it all up and puree it myself? Problem is, is that you'll cut into the seeds and the seeds is where all the bitterness happens. It's a lot of tannins, a lot of bitterness in the seeds. So the easiest way is to take them, freeze them, that breaks down the cell structure of the fruit. Then once they thaw out, a lot of times all you have to do is just cut a hole in the bag and let the juice drain out. We use the fruit bag to contain all of the pulp because that's essential in the color and the flavor for your wine as well. So the reason that I freeze all of my fruit is not only to keep it fresh in the freezer, and, but it also breaks down the cell structure. And you can do that with any types of fruits. So an alternate method, instead of freezing it, if you're gonna be using whole fruit, raspberries, or strawberries, another way to do it from the fresh fruit is to chop it up into small pieces. You can put it into the, the fermentation bucket, but then you add about three quarters of a gallon of very hot water. Not boiling, because you don't want to cook the fruit, but very, very hot water. And what that'll do is that will also break down the cell structure. The difficulty with that is, is now you've got it all in a, in a ferment, in a must. If I was to do it that way, just to be safe, I would pour it back into a straining bag just to contain all of the seeds. That way you don't have to play with a sieve, worry about chopping up any of the seeds. That way you have it all contained. The ferment process, the yeast is still going to be able to get at the color and it's all going to extract right from the fruit. You can do it either way, whichever way works best. What I found is that freezing the fruit, breaking it down, and fermenting it that way works a lot faster. Okay, so now we're going to show you how to make wine from fresh fruit that's frozen that you receive right from the grocery store. You get it in the frozen food section, you take it home and you can either put it in the freezer or if you're going to be fermenting right away, take it out of the freezer and wait at least 24 hours for it to come up to room temperature. A really, really cold batch of wine isn't going to ferment. The yeast doesn't like it. So you want to make sure that you're up to about 65, 70 degrees or about in room temperature. So at this point here, we've got about, with raspberries, you want to have about three to four pounds. And a lot of times they're not packaged in pounds, so you're going to have to do the math. These are in 12 ounce, 12 ounce bags. So I'll do the math. So we'll get started. First thing you want to do is tear these open. And like I said, these have been thawed and just dump them right into your fermentation bag. This is where it gets fun. You might make a mess. You want to preserve as much juice as you possibly can. And the reason for the bag, especially when you're using frozen, frozen fruit, is that you're able to maintain all of the flavor from the, from the raspberries, or if you've got black raspberries or whatever fruit that you're using, and the color. The color is going to be very, very important at the end. There we go, last one. The other hint that I'll have for you too is that if you've got frozen fruit, even if they're in Ziploc bags, and that keeps the air out, you'll still wind up with a little bit of fruit juice that's in the bottom of your container. You can simply pour that back in here too. Because I know all of you listened when I said you have to make sure that everything is clean. So even the bowl is clean when you first get started. So now you've got all of your frozen fruit in the bag and you can just let the, the juices drop out or you can take a nice tongs and squeeze as much of the juice out of it as you can. What you want to do is extract as much of the juice as you can to start with but you don't want to squeeze really, really tight because you don't want to break any of the seeds. Remember I said the seeds are the ones that have got all of the tannins and all the bitterness to them. And the process after that is pretty much the same as the, as the fruit from the puree. So now that we've added our fresh fruit, what we want to do is top this up with a gallon of water to the gallon mark. And then we'll be adding some ingredients to it. And you want to extract as much of the fruit as you can at this point, squeezing it with the tongs. So let me remove this just for a second so that we can add our ingredients. And what we'll be adding today 
We'll be adding pectic enzyme, a half a teaspoon. Also, we want to add our acid blend. Calls for three quarters of a teaspoon. That's three of these. And we also want to add some yeast nutrient, and that'll keep the yeast happy. When you're using fresh fruit that you've grown yourself, or if you get it at the store, the most important part is to make sure that you have a Camden tablet in it that'll kill any wild yeast that might be on the fruit. The easiest way to do that is to take one of these Camden tablets, this pre-measured for one gallon batch, and crush it between two spoons. You simply take it, put it between two spoons, crush it up so that you've got a nice powder. Put that into about a quarter of a cup of lukewarm water so that it has a chance to dissolve. If you put it directly into your must, it might float on top and not really do what you want it to do. Mix it in really, really nice, get it dissolved, pour that into your must, and then you can stir everything else in. And again, a nice clean spoon that you're using to stir that all up. Now you wait 24 hours for that Camden tablet to do its work. Add the fruit back in because that's going to extract the color from the raspberries into your new wine. Attach the cover in the airlock and wait 24 hours and then you pitch your yeast and then you can move on to the second part. One thing to keep in mind when you're shopping for fresh frozen fruit in the store, make sure that it's fresh frozen and it doesn't have any preservatives in it. If it has any kind of a sorbate or benzoate compound in it to preserve its flavor, it is not fermentable. So make sure that you've got fresh uh, frozen fruit from the store without any preservatives. Uh, benzoate and sorbate are not your friend. For the purposes of demonstration, we actually started a separate batch about a week ago so that we could show you the racking process moving the wine from the primary to the secondary. When the ferment process gets to about 1.04 in your ferment process, it's time to rack your wine or siphon it into the carboy. So what we've done, you take the lid off and you remove the fermentation bag from the must. That's done at this point. Now what you want to do is you want to siphon this into your carboy. What you want to do is you want to put that up onto a higher surface so it makes it a lot easier and then you've got gravity working for you. Now is when you use the siphon tube and your one gallon carboy. Put it down into your fermentation bucket, in, down into your glass carboy and siphon it from your fermentation bucket without letting oxygen get on it. You know, as you'll notice that the, the color of the raspberry is a lighter colored pink at this point. As it gets into the carboy, it'll darken back up again. This stage of the siphoning process is for the clearing process. What you want to do is get it off of all the dead yeast and the sediment that's on the bottom of the, carboy, of the, of the fermentation bucket at this point. And just siphon over as clear of wine as you possibly can. This is where it will finish its ferment process and then you can either use it for the clearing process or if you're going to be sweetening back, doing any kind of back sweetening, then you would do that at this point. Once it gets close to the end of the siphoning process, you want to tip the bucket up in the air a little bit, but also you don't want to pick up any of the, the sediment that's in the bottom of the bucket. You leave that behind. Now at this point, you want to put the airlock back on it. You can use the same airlock that you had on the bucket before, but now in addition, you want to make sure that no air can get in here. You've got these handy little caps that exactly fits this three-piece airlock. Screw this on. Put this in here. Make sure you've got a nice level in here, and it will continue to ferment. You can see the bubbles here. It's still fermenting. When the, the airlock ceases to bubble, you're pretty much done with your fermentation. Take another, uh, another specific gravity reading, and it should be at about 0.99 or less than one, and then you know your ferment is complete, and then we'll finish it off at that point. So here we are, we've gotten to the end. Missed a couple of steps, so I'm gonna back up a second for you. We showed you how to rack it from the primary into the secondary, and to let it finish fermenting. There's a couple more steps in there that you need to do because you might have to rack it one or two more times to get it this clear. Because you're still gonna have some fallout, some sediment from the yeast and the particulate that's in the wine. 
So after about the first week or two after it's finished completion of its ferment process, you'll need to rack it into another carboy. If you only have one of these jugs, you can simply rack it back into the, the bucket that was provided, clean the carboy out and rack it back in, or you can invest in a second one of these, it makes it a lot easier. One gallon jugs like this, cider comes in them, a lot of things come in them. So you could use one of those as long as it's sanitized. So the other thing, once it's completely clear from, it, you don't want to just immediately bottle it. You want to taste test it first. So we use what we call a bench trial, where you'll take out, using your three-piece uh, three thief, thief out a little bit of it and put it into three different glasses. Taste it, see what you think. If it doesn't taste sweet enough for your taste, then that's what we call back sweetening. At that point, in the kit, you'll find some potassium sorbate. That's what I told you not to use at the beginning. You use that at the end to prevent anything from further fermentation. So you'd add the potassium sorbate into this jug and then add a little bit of sugar. Stir it up really good, let it sit for about a day, retest it. If it tastes good, be ready for bottling. If it still needs a little bit of flavoring, um, you can add a little bit more sugar. In some wines, you might even have to add a little bit of a tannin to it. If it doesn't taste sharp enough, you can take some of the acid blend, again, that comes in the kit, and put a little bit in there just to your taste. It's all up to you. Once you've got it completely stable and you like the way it tastes, you're ready for bottling. All you need to do at that point is to remove the cover and the airlock and get out your racking cane and your siphon and in this case, you're going to be using the bottle filler. What I've done at this point is I filled the whole thing with water after I sanitized it, and that's going to make it a lot easier to get the siphon started. A little trick that I learned. So this is how this works. So you take the, this end, it's got the tip on it, put it in there, and you notice everything still has water in it because you're completely no oxygen. So at this point, put it into a glass jar off onto the side someplace until you see the wine coming through. Once the wine gets to the bottom of the bottle filler, then you're ready to bottle. Make sure your bottles are nice and clean as well. I use a lot of brand new bottles, but you can reuse bottles at that point. Just make sure that they're rinsed out really good, take the labels off, and use a metabisulfite or your cleaning solution that you got in the kit. Then you simply need to just drop this down. This has got a spring tip on it so that it doesn't leak all over the place. Simply put it down into the bottom and start your fill. You've already got the siphon started. Keep it down below. And away she goes. It's a very pretty color too. I like working with raspberry. When you're working with strawberry, it comes out kind of an orangish color. When you're working with apple, it kind of comes out a golden color, depending on what kind of apples that you use. Watermelon's tricky. It's a really light pink. You almost can't even tell that it's being bottled. A gallon like this, once it's been fermented, will make about four and a half to five bottles of wine. You can either use the tall 750 bottles like this, or you can use what we call splits, which is a 375. You should be able to get about nine bottles out of a one gallon batch of fruit wine with these, depending on if you're going to share or if you're going to drink it right away. Usually fruit wines, you can drink within the first month or two afterwards, but they taste a lot better after about six months to a year. The heavier the fruit, dark fruits, that sort of thing, the longer you want to let them sit in a nice cellar back to where you were fermenting before. Now in this situation here, you notice I'm filling it all the way up to the top. The reason I'm filling it all the way up to the top like that is kind of counterintuitive because you think, oh wait, I need to have enough room for the cork. The nice thing about these bottle fillers is the bottle filler takes up exactly the amount of space that you need for a cork makes it simple as possible. Then, because you've got a spring tip bottle filler, you just simply go back on to the next bottle. And fill that one, tip the jug until you all the way down to the bottom of it. And if you don't quite have a full bottle, you can either drink that one right away or you can transfer it from there into a split. If you've got a little bit in here, got your glass handy, <laughs> you're taste testing. Now that we've shown you how to bottle this, We'll come back and show you how to get it corked, stable, and cellared. Okay, we're going to bottle the rest of the gallon jug in just a second. First, I want to show you how, it e how easy it is to put a cork into the bottle. You take 
take your cork, you sanitize corker. This is a two-piece corker. You simply put the cork in the top of this thing, put it over the top of it, and you just push it into the bottle. If you can't get it into the bottle right off the get, you can hit it with a, with a rubber mallet and you're corked and you're ready to go. And there you go. So just for comparison, this is the bottle of wine that we just bottled. It's a very, very nice raspberry. Just for comparison, this is a bottle of raspberry that I bottled a couple of, a couple of years ago. And look at the color. Isn't that beautiful? Well, now that we've shown you how to make wine from fruit, the fruit's in the labor, right? Now we get a chance to taste it. So I'm going to try this, my raspberry wine from a couple years ago. First thing you want to do is make sure that it smells like raspberry. Remember I said, if it doesn't look like raspberry, it doesn't smell like raspberry. Some went wrong. This one smells like raspberry. Definitely tastes like raspberry. One of the reasons that you use fresh raspberries and enough of the fresh raspberries is to get a full raspberry flavor to it. The other thing that you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it on the video, but are the legs. That shows that you've got the right sugar content and the right alcohol content for a nice balanced wine. The aroma is phenomenal. I mean, it's a very, very nice bouquet of raspberry. When you taste it, it wants to be crisp. You want it to taste like putting a raspberry in your mouth, except for now you know that it's wine. But it will taste like tasting fresh raspberries. It's, that's why you have to have the acid, the sugar, and the alcohol all balanced in order for it to be called what we call full mouth. So when you take a sip of it and it stays in your mouth, it's got a long-lasting flavor. That's what this has. It's very, very nice. The other one of my favorites is elderberry. Very, very popular here. Um, in fact, there's even a category for it all by itself, the State Fair. If you don't know what elderberry smells like, it's a great way to do it is to go out and get a bottle of elderberry and smell it first before you even try and make the wine. Very rich, very aromatic, dark fruit, berry flavored. Tastes like an elderberry. That one was a blue ribbon winner at the State Fair. So was that one. <laughs> so you can do it. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me to share with you on how I make wine from fruit. It's been a lot of fun. And you can see, you can enjoy the fruits of your success as well. Hopefully I've made it easy enough that you can make your own wine from fruit, either from the store or from your backyard. If you have any further questions at all, please visit us at northernbrewer.com. If you've got any questions on any of the equipment or any of the processes or any of the ingredients that come into them, visit us. We'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Have a great day. Cheers.